Looking more like something from the English countryside, Aberglassen House is a vision splendid in the rolling hills of the Hunter. The Georgian-style two-storey sandstone home was built in 1840 for an estimated £20,000. Its owner forced to abandon the property after going broke. The home boasts high ceilings painstakingly painted and red cedar joinery faithfully restored by its owners. Living in a house like this, exquisite. I can only describe the experiences that, and um, the space, the um, the sheer beauty of the finishes in the house, the joinery, and the proportions, perfect proportions. Unfortunately, the house has never lived up to its real potential. An exterior fireplace, evidence of two rear wings which were never built, and an incomplete front veranda. Sold to a local doctor, Aberglassen House is changing hands. Its owners sad to be leaving after six memorable years. It's um, a very difficult house to leave and I've really never felt that about any other property that we've ever lived in. The property will be open one last time this weekend before the new owners move in. Blake Doyle, NBN News. Angela Tisdall was arrested in August last year after asking an undercover police officer to carry out a hit on her lover Craig Miller's pregnant wife Penny. She had originally asked a workmate, Leroy Evans, to organise the contract killing and had given him $10,000 in payment as well as handwritten instructions and directions to the Miller's house. After stealing the money for himself, Evans accidentally dropped the envelope containing the information. It was eventually handed in to police. A meeting between Tisdall and the undercover policeman was then arranged, where a listening device was used to record Tisdall organising to have Penny Miller killed. Judge Ralph Coulihan sentenced Tisdall to a minimum of four years jail today. He says in handing down his sentence he took into account the fact that Tisdall had no prior convictions, had pleaded guilty to the charge and was a gullible and easily influenced person. Tanya Carlisle, NBN News. I grew up in Western, so Western, I'm a Western baby, so um, it's unreal. The Year 7 science class at Tomary High School was heating an iodine solution with Bunsen burners when the lab filled with toxic fumes. 12-year-old Adam Lemke was one of 20 students overcome by the poisoned air. We got shown what to do first and then 
when we did it, um, after a while it all just started to overflow and we got evacuated. Parents were told of the emergency as ambulances ferried the students to the nearby polyclinic. Yeah, naturally we're parents were concerned about it. Yeah, so I had to come in here and the kids are okay I think. There's a few that are a bit sore but my son's okay, thank goodness. The children suffered eye and respiratory irritations, some more seriously than others. A few of the children have sore chests, um, a couple of them have uh, a bit worse asthma. The school has launched an investigation at the same time backing the actions of its teachers. Two or three teachers uh, responded, irrigating a, a few eyes that were quite red and, uh, and getting the, the students into a safe, secure area so that they could be tended to by the ambulance officers. Paul Lobb, NBN News. A familiar chant, this time ringing out at the National Australia Bank State Headquarters as steel tank and pipe workers step up their campaign chasing over $3 million in entitlements. They've asked the NAB to write off the embattled business's $10 million debt so they can finally see their entitlements. They've also received support from the state government. Union officials then met with bank management, who claim they don't want to set a precedent in foregoing debt, despite a recent record profit of $3.2 billion. Meanwhile, another Newcastle business has fallen victim to the debacle. The mobile service station at Islington is undergoing a major refit, but with two new steel tanks for holding petrol behind the picket line, the business can't begin trading. Ten staff have been laid off. I think the picketers are entitled to their rights, just like any other worker, but are certainly having no, give no, no help to what we're, we're about here at the present minute. And I would just like it to be resolved as quickly as possible. Steel tank and pipe owners Stephen and Bradley Weeks are still declining media interviews. Instead, their agent says they are trying to come up with a solution. That solution could be put to workers within a week. Blake Doyle. NBN News. Residents are not just locking their doors, they've stepped up security, window locks, improved security doors, even patrols, all in a bid to keep intruders out after what they say has been frequent attempts to gain entry. These things are becoming so regular, the break-ins and attempts, that the residents are just feeling absolutely terrorised and are just living in fear at the moment. And the offenders have been daring. They've, you know, tried to get into units in broad daylight. It just seems so brazen, I can't believe it. Margaret Peet says the glass in her window was cut last week. Just enough to get his hand in so that he could pull the sliding window back. The intruder fleeing when he was spotted. Residents no longer feel safe in their own homes. It's the trauma that lasts for days and weeks. And when you see your friends walking about in that state, you know, it could be quite disturbing, quite disturbing. Police are urging residents to make sure they report all incidents. We can uh, develop an intelligence bank concerning that particular problem and then commit troops to, um, to address it. Brooke Webster, NBN News. Now I've got to somehow re-secure that chain plate yeah. to give the purpose of the yeah, So yeah. what he's tried
Police will use hidden surveillance cameras as part of their campaign to stop licensee selling alcohol to people who've already had one too many. Put it this way, somebody who's going to uh, come unstuck very soon and uh, we're going to make sure that uh, we make an example of those. Police say most who enjoy a night out at the city's licensed venues behave responsibly, as do the operators themselves. But Newcastle Police Commander Ron Bender says establishments who don't must pay the price, claiming they're a catalyst for escalating alcohol-related crime, such as nighttime assaults in the CBD. Newcastle's no longer a fun place to be, it's a dangerous place to be. Licensees who are members of the Liquor Record told about the Blitz today. In fact, I would say that by and large it's only a minority that uh, causes the trouble. The Accord is just not a printed up document. You know, the signatories have a responsibility. To Police say they're not afraid to use their power of shutting down an establishment for 72 hours. But the most common penalty is a fine of up to $5,500. Meanwhile, in an ongoing bid to stop crime and drug deals on the city's trains and buses, Transit Police and Customs Sniffer Dogs will be out in force this weekend. Vanessa Trezais, NBN News. At the end of the day, we'll offer more. It won't be gambling, it'll be a whole range of new facilities. With 24 drivers turning out, it seemed the dispute between a section of super sedan drivers and the Newcastle Speedway had been resolved. Of those returning, Australian champion Ron Pine. But the signs were there that this was going to be a tough night out. Alan Baker was back too, but a run-in with the young gun, David Robinson, had the veteran in trouble with the Speedway wall. Baker was fuming, so much so he walked back along the track to show the chief steward exactly what he thought. Ron Pine's night wasn't getting much better as he was muscled to the outside. Battles raged throughout the field, but a mid-pack crash thinned things out even more, with Luke Pine and John Smith among those in trouble. Smith had ripped off his rear axle, but it was a punctured arm that saw him taken to Maitland Hospital. Back racing and what a grandstand finish. Four drivers had their chance to win it, but on the final lap Bernie Roberts had grabbed the lead from Robert Carrig. That made the battle for third a real fight, with David Robertson and Dennis Sims going door to door, with Robertson just taking third. For Bernie Roberts though, victory was sweet, adding the feature final to his top six shootout win.
One day old Shauna Longley doesn't know it yet, but if and when she asks her parents where she was born, an interesting tale will unfold. Belinda woke up with labour pains just two minutes apart at about three o'clock yesterday morning. She and her husband made babysitting arrangements for their first child, Chloe, before heading to the Toronto ambulance station. The depot was manned, but in his panicked state, Michael didn't wait around for long enough. Well, I had to get out two doors to get to the person who was loudly ringing the bell and by the time I got out the second door, um, Michael had left, taken off down the road. He'd rushed just 50 metres down the road and pulled into the mobile petrol station. Michael here come running in telling me that I had to ring an ambulance because his wife was about to give birth to a baby. Went in and seen this bloke to ring the ambulance and by the time I got back out there to the car about two minutes later the baby was arrived before the ambulance even got there and by which time a fair crowd had gathered. Oh, we had a security guard, a policeman, um, hike, a lady. <laughs> we had a few people around. A few minutes later, the ambulance pulled up. It was pretty easy after that major work had been done by Belinda and I just had to cut the cord and wrap the baby up and check on their observation, check they were OK and get them to hospital. Mother and baby are both doing well at the John Hunter Hospital. Shauna still blissfully unaware of the commotion she caused. Catherine Turner, NBN News. Talk to the locals in Windale and you'll find out that while many are not proud of aspects of their neighbourhood, they believe it's a good place to live. That's a disgrace. Who would want to come to Windale and see that? And I mean, I'm very much for Windale because I read my three boys here. Kids stay out all night and make noise and stuff. I haven't had any problems. I think it's a nice area. Since a statewide report last year labelled it the worst suburb in New South Wales based on income, education, crime and the treatment of children, locals have fought back. They've prepared a community renewal plan involving businesses, governments, welfare agencies and the police that aims to renew a sense of community. I think it's probably the first real plan that's uh, a positive step forward. Uh, a lot of the previous ideas and plans have tended to tinker around the edges without really involving the community. Police say perceptions of the crime problem at Windale are wrong. No better and no worse than the majority of other suburbs in the, in, in the Hunter region, quite frankly. A meeting next Thursday at the Community Hall will plan the next step in the suburb's new life. Paul Lobb, NBN News. Ron Stevens was forced out of bed when lightning hit his TV antenna and a power line, causing a wave of explosions.
The impact ripped a hole through the laundry ceiling and started a fire. Light fittings exploded and electrical switches were blown from the walls. The force left scorch marks on the kitchen walls and exposed telephone wires. All power was cut off to the house, neighbours witnessing sparks flying out of the metre box. Despite all the action across the sky last night, the SES reported a quiet evening. It's long time black spots like the Bucketsway Sway and Lakes Way on the mid north coast that can expect improvements over the next four years. And many are hoping the Road to Recovery program will make a difference to the state of the notorious Pacific Highway, with areas like the Hastings and Kempsey offered a healthy portion of today's funding. In fact, the Greater Taree area topped the list with more than $4.1 million. Further north, the Tweed can expect $3.96 million, with Lismore collecting just over three million dollars. Meanwhile, flood affected areas in the state's northwest also featured, the Armadale area receiving more than two million dollars compared to three hundred and fifty thousand for Glen Innes. More than half a million dollars was also devoted to one of the worst hit flood areas at Nundal where two bridges were destroyed. Helen Kapalos, MBN News. Our concern is that um, if, pay, if pay, uh, the doctors are too tired and uh, too stressed to work effectively, then their patient care will suffer during the day. It was meant to be a big season for Anthony Manaka after being voted South Melbourne's rising star of falling out with his coach saw him dumped from the NSL squad. Although he was desperate to play top grade football, it still took two months before his club would release him. Finally after two months everything has been settled and I'm just you know, looking forward to playing and proving they've made a big mistake in helping Newcastle. The attacking midfielder signed on the dotted line today and was immediately named in Newcastle's team to play Wollongong on Friday night. He's probably best role the way I see him is behind two good strikers and he knows that. He's a good floating type player that can drift around, play as a midfield and then he's got the speed to just burn you. Given the new addition, Sterry won't finalise his starting lineup until later this week with 17 named today. But it's one player in the Wolves squad that the Newcastle coach is also concerned with. Wollongong striker Scott Chipperfield was cleared to play by Soccer Australia overnight, effectively overturning an earlier decision to make him serve a one-week suspension. It's going to be interesting if he does saddle up on Friday night, because I don't believe he should be allowed to. There's been previous players in the same situation. Jim Callanan, NBN News. According to meteorologists, this is about as severe as thunderstorms come. Moving west to east, Aberdeen in the Upper Hunter bore the first blast of strong winds. Last week, this house was surrounded by flood water. Today, its roof was torn off. Jim Atchison was in the living room with his wife when the storm hit. Bang! She hit in about five seconds. The whole roof off the house was gone and uh, everything was demolished. So strong were the winds, the roof was flung several hundred metres away, while trees around the home were uprooted. Further east and Brankston was next in the storm's path, fierce winds tearing the roof off the commercial hotel. The debris landed on the hotel's awning, sending it crashing to the ground and bringing down power lines. A ute parked next to the hotel didn't escape either. 
The New England Highway was blocked for over an hour as emergency crews cleared the scene. It's estimated up to 100 millimetres of rain was dumped on parts of the Hunter, swelling creeks and rivers. The electrical storms knocked out power to over 3,500 homes. Crews will work through the night to restore electricity to those affected. Blake Doyle, NBN News Late Edition. They may have been drafted to compete for rival states, but they're all from the same neck of the woods. And today, two of the three Newcastle competitors took to the calm waters at Blacksmith's Beach before their assault on Manly for round one of the National Surf League this weekend. If you get a good start, you feel strong all the way through the series and uh, hopefully at the end uh, come through with a win for the team and individually. 22-year-old Adrian is competing in the Ironman event for Tasmania Torpedoes, hoping not only for a good start to the season, but to stay on top of an increasingly competitive field. We've got Dean and Darren Mercer, uh, they're the old stalwarts of the series, so uh, they'll be there just like they always are. Uh, Zane Holmes and uh, a young guy named Daniel Shade from down uh, the central coast. Also from Newcastle is 18-year-old Ryan Norrie, who is making a debut in the Surf League for Western Australia's Stingrays. His forte is the swimming, and as most beginners are, he's confident of a good result, but knows that there are several challenges to face. In a surf race, pretty much everyone, because the surf will be pretty flat this weekend. Um, we've got a race against a mixture of Ironmen and surf swimmers, so I don't really, I really think everyone's someone to beat. The series starts this Sunday in Sydney. Adam Harper, NBN News. While steelmaking stopped a year ago, the BHP steel strapping plant has been pumping out 1,200 tonnes of the packing material each month, fulfilling domestic and export orders with New Zealand and the United States. But with a rival plant opening soon at Western, the 44 Mayfield workers knew their time would come. OK, for us, for the last time, start him up the super. Please. Frank Olegnizak has been a controller for 20 years. The emotion of today's final run beyond words. So how does it make you feel today? Bit sad. Uh. The plant has been Joe Toby's life. It's been more like a family affair. The blokes always work together pretty well. Worked with a lot of good blokes over the last 30 years. With the final switches thrown, most of the men have new jobs to go to, some at BHP's Port Kembla strapping plant. Paul Lobb, NBN News.
Chloe Webb's family would have celebrated her first birthday this Sunday. Her brief life cut short four months ago. Stepfather Daryl Raymond Webb today charged with her murder and faced Maitland Court. On the morning of the 28th of August, Webb had been babysitting the infant and four other siblings aged under five at this Raymond Terrace home, while the children's mother, Heather Lawson, was out shopping. The court heard Webb, who had long helped care for the baby, called an ambulance when he discovered the child unconscious in her cot. Placed on life support, the baby later died in hospital. There's no answers to it. I feel dead. And I have been since Chloe's death. Defence solicitor Danny Smythe told the court that a police allegation that baby Chloe's death was linked with shaken baby syndrome was sheer and utter speculation, of which there was no evidence. He also stated that Chloe was a child for which the accused had a great deal of affection and her mother was convinced of his innocence. But Webb was refused bail. He'll again face Newcastle Court next Tuesday. Vanessa Trezai's MBN News. We're doing it for the right cause. We're doing it for the underprivileged children and everyone loves to do something for the underprivileged children. They're our next generation.